Our, our next speaker is someone that um, those of us who were seeking speakers would just love this guy because uh, he's not only smart and experienced, he's extremely interesting, he's got a sense of humor. We don't have enough of that in today's world. And so uh, if you don't know Mark Mills, uh, we're delighted to have him. He's going to visit with us. Mark is the founder and executive director of the National Center for Energy Analytics. That right there tells you the type of animal we're dealing with. He looks at the numbers. Um, he's a distinguished senior fellow at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He's a contributing editor at City Journal. He's a faculty fellow at Northwestern University's School of Engineering, and he's a co-founding partner in Montrose Lane. He's also the author of a lot of books, The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom, and a roaring 2020s. He served as the chairman and CTO of ICX Technologies. He also served in President Reagan's White House as a science officer, and before that was an experimental physicist and development engineer in microprocessors and fiber optics, earning several patents. Uh, could I have a round of applause for Mr. Mark Mills? Thank you, Maynard, and uh, thank you, Senator Hudson and John, and and Maynard for the honor of joining you. And uh, this, is, this has become my second home. I'm originally Canadian. I'm now American as well, but my friends in Texas tell me that now that I'm affiliated with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, I have to remind people that I have another uh, political affiliation, national affiliation as a quasi-honorary Texan, which is great. This, uh, this is framed, Maynard told me, and John, you're framing this as forecasting, looking at the future. The panel's been fascinating. People are tempted to push on their forecasts, whether it's forecasting the price of natural gas, what will happen to LNG exports, what will happen to wind and solar, political futures. So let me just say one thing about forecasting. I'm, I, I, I would think of myself as a professional forecaster, but all of us do forecasting in our lives. It's inherent in human nature, whether it's our personal life or our business life, we're always engaged in trying to think about consequences in the future for things we do today. We try to teach our children, you know, get the forebrain to develop what consequences in the future for things you do today that are incorrect. But forecasting is innate to human, human nature. But technology forecasting, I would contend, is easier than most other kinds of forecasting, especially political forecasting. Um, but there are, and that's why I have a book, my book, my latest book is really a forecasting book. And it's a lot about energy too, but the word energy is not in the title or a subtitle because I knew that would frighten the cupcakes away and they wouldn't read it. So you'll find a lot about energy that I'm going to tell you about in the book. But it's also about automation and robotics, AI. It's about material science. It's about the structure of education, entertainment, and manufacturing, the futures of technologies. But if you think hard about when you read forecasts, you, we're all consumers of forecasts, whatever your field's in. And it, there's three kinds of forecasters. And I'm, I'm going to say this because I like to think I'm one of the three kinds. And there's sort of a Venn diagram that they overlap in terms of behaviors and tendencies. But you, 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 we, all, we all are subjected to three kinds of forecasters. First, the, the forecasters that are paid to be entertaining. Because you know, clickbait forecasting or apocalyptic forecasting, a future shock for those of a certain age, remember Alvin Toffler, uh, it, it literally can tell it's a, it's a paid to entertain kind of forecasting. And it's very common and it's a lot of fun and it's nice to be entertaining. I mean, who, who doesn't want to be entertaining? I mean, it's much more fun to be paid for that than it is for being boring. But that's not really forecasting. It's, it's deliberately meant to be provocative. Then there's the forecasters that are, are paid to sell their book. Now, anybody that's a trader knows what that means from Wall Street. Uh, you've got a story or a product or an idea or a, you've got something you're selling. And so your forecasts are either overtly biased <clears throat> by virtue of the fact that you're selling something. You're selling an idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. The energy transition is an idea. You're selling solar panels. Or you're selling a politician's agenda for immigration. So even if you're not doing it overtly, Human nature and cognitive dissonance means that your forecasts become tilted to what you're selling. It's just human nature. And there's a third kind of forecaster, and they're the ones that are paid to be right, self-evidently. And those forecasters <clears throat> are generally not in the public uh, domain. Uh, they are often hired by uh, hedge funds, PE funds. With a little luck, they're occasionally hired by 
government entities and agencies because their, their goal isn't to be either entertaining or to sell anything, it's to get, get the future right. So you can make investments based on it if you're in the government or investments based on it if you're in the private sector. I like to think what I do is in the third category, but I'm very well aware of the fact that some of the things I will tell you will sound provocative and therefore clickbaity, uh, but they're based on data and facts. I'm a physicist. So it's it's a, a discipline I don't usually confess in public when I'm in Washington where I live because it's sort of a radioactive field, no pun intended, for the Washington nomenclatura who are you know, lobbyists and, and lawyers. Not that I don't like lobbyists and lawyers, but I'm not either. So let's talk about the future of energy and energy technology, because everything about energy and energy technology and forecasting it is fundamentally anchored in technology of the machines and the policies that allow the machines to get built and so forth. But I want to just very briefly dispose of the thing I'm not going to talk about at all, except with one slide, <clears throat> which is the climate debate. And the reason I put this slide up I mean, you may, not, you may not be a consumer of the New Yorker magazine. I am. I like to read everything. I'm sort of omnivorous in this. By everything, I mean technology-wise as well as in public policy and literature. Th this says everything you need to say in the headline for the long essay. It was a very long essay written by, oh, uh, I forget. I think the author in this case might have, was a, was a, wasn't a scientist. It was a writer who's angsty about the climate and the apocalypse. And of course, then you have right before the last uh, climate conference, Nature magazine, which is a science magazine, with this headline: "You know, the science is clear: fossil fuels must go." So this is this is the fact that we're dealing. The reason we're talking about energy and energy transition is because of this, not because we're running out of energy. The whole energy debates began when the world thought we were running out of energy, foolishly because the oil, Arab oil embargo of 73, 74 was not about running out of oil. It was the counterparty, the king of Saudi Arabia, running out of patience with our president, Nixon, who helped Israel with intel from our satellites to defeat the Arab invasion of Israel at that time. So we cut off our oil supply. And then the world thought we were running out of oil, which if you were a rational person, this sounds sort of hysterical and silly because we weren't running out of oil. We were, we were running out of their willingness to sell us their oil, and we were not drilling as much here at that time. But regardless, the, the point I want to make to you is the two science magisteria of climate, guessing how the world's planetary climate system operates and what it will look like 100 years from now or 50 years from now or even 10 years from now, that whole domain is a profoundly different magisteria of science than how energy machines work. They have nothing to do with each other. Inertia, thermodynamics, mechanical, electrical engineering that tells you how airplanes fly, what kind of fuel they can use, how you can make electricity, how much electricity data centers use, all those domains have nothing whatsoever to do with what you think, one way or the other, about whether the planet is warming or not warming, we're warming faster or slower. Not, they're unrelated magisteria. They're, they're as related as your opinion on whether you like Taylor Swift concerts and what kind of vehicle you use to go to the concert. They're different magisteria. They are related. You have to get to the concert if you happen to like it. But how you get there has nothing to do with her music. Those, this, these are the levels of differentiation. So I'm going to talk about energy without talking about climate. But stipulating the reason we're talking about energy is entirely because of the narrative that we have a, quote, climate problem from burning hydrocarbons. The question you would have to ask yourself is, uh, can we do something different? I mean, the energy transition is the claim that we can do something different with the energy systems, not just of the United States, but of the world. So the first order question is, is there anything different going on now than, say, four or five years ago or 50 years ago when we first began passing energy policy legislation? And I, just, I, I picked two people who are well known to Texans to sort of epitomize the, the two domains that matter to think about the future and to make forecasts. Uh, one is on the demand side, how we use energy, the other's on the supply side. And for those of you who didn't read Larry Fink's uh, latest letter this, earlier this year, in which he described their, you know, he does an annual letter. And BlackRock, of course, is in infamous in Texas for reasons you all know with respect to how Texas has treated uh, investors who are anti-oil and gas. But what was interesting about his letter was he talks about it as a major force, a major economic trend. It's true. The idea, the idea, not the is, is, it is a big, big deal politically. Witness the Inflation Reduction Act, which is in fact they bragged about after passing it 
on a partisan basis, as I think both Rob and Jim pointed out, uh, was basically the Green New Deal. They're proud of that. But interestingly, BlackRock's total investment portfolio in the letter, Larry Fink pointed out, they have $300 billion of their uh, investments in traditional energy, oil, gas, and coal, uh, which constitutes 75% of their total investments in energy. So Mr. Energy Transition here has made a bet, speaking of how funds make bets, 75% weighted towards traditional energy. Should tell you something, which I'll talk about. And then Elon Musk recently, he said a lot of things, but recently, <laughs> he says a lot of things often, more often than Larry Fink. He recently said at a conference, which I, which I was, happened to watch, it was in Berlin, I was here, so they, you know, it was a typical Zoomified conference. But he said a couple things uh, early in the year that you, we now hear a lot about. He just said electric cars and AI, he specifically called out artificial intelligence, are creating tremendous demand. And uh, he said, soon you're not gonna find enough electricity. He gave uh, an interview at the Edison Electric Institute's, uh, one of their annual conference, I think, a year ago, I think before Dan was, or may have been already the CEO of EEI, in which he berated the electric utility industry at large, all the CEOs gathered, for not planning for enough electric demand. And he did that before the news became hot news pre-summer about the, quote, surprise increase in electric demand. So let me lay out for you 12 truths that inform how, how one can make forecasts about energy, six truths about demand, and six truths about supply. When I say truths, these are not political truths. These are statements I'll show you which are based on facts, either statistical facts or physics facts. So, the, so I would call this sort of preaching the gospel of reality for which, from which you can evolve an opinion. I have opinions, but I wanna lay out for you 12 truths. And, the, and six again on supply and six on demand. The pictures I'm showing you here are covers of Time Magazine which are relevant to demand and supply. CEO of NVIDIA was featured two years before ChatGPT was, was unveiled to the world. ChatGPT was under development when this picture was taken, but nobody ever heard of it. So Time Magazine, man of the year, two years before the discovery by the general public of AI. I wrote about AI a lot in my book. It was published just uh, a few months before <clears throat> the um, announcement of ChatGPT, but AI, those in the computing industry are very familiar with AI and its trajectory and its growth. This is, it was no surprise, but it was a surprise to the general public. And then I'm showing you on the supply side a cover from Time Magazine. This is a personal cover. I don't know Jensen uh, Huang, I, but, I, but I do know Three Mile Island because as a young immigrant to the United States, a documented immigrant, it was you know not easy to become a documented immigrant from Canada because Canadians are suspect nations. It's very hard to very hard to emigrate, it's a very low quota. It's bizarre, but it's true. And I arrived in the United States working for the commercial nuclear industry as their science advisor uh, two months before the accident at Three Mile Island took place, and this will date me. I spent the week of the accident at the site of the accident, and then I spent the next six, seven years of my life on the road defending the virtues of nuclear energy and being yelled at and screamed at as a baby killer. I, it was a bizarre experience for me having never been in the media public domain in my career prior to that. So nuclear energy is particularly close to me. I completely agree with Jim Hackett. It's, it's the future. It's a tough future. So the 12 truths. And I'll do them fairly quickly. Uh, truth, this, is on, this is on the supply side. We'll do supply side first because I'm a supply side economist, or at least I play one on TV. There are no energy transitions. I, it's a silly word. Uh, it's used all the time. Our side buys into it and, and talks about it. There isn't, there, so let's just do the data. This is data, this is not an opinion. So the graph on your left, you've seen, you've, this room, you've got to know this. You've all seen this kind of graph with variance on it. There are lots of variants on this graph. This is one just covers a roughly 60 year period for the world and total pr production of energy of all the major sources. And what you see here is zero evidence of a transition. For 20 years, the world has spent several trillions, probably if you count it correctly, by both the IEA numbers and Bloomberg numbers, roughly $10 trillion to $20 trillion has been spent since the year 2000 to avoid using oil, gas, and coal. So just think of that, the two, that number and then look at the results. Doesn't mean there isn't more of the other stuff. What you see in this picture is energy additions. And if you pick any time in human history, what you'll see are energy additions. There has never been 
an energy transition in human history. And there won't be for foreseeable futures, which sounds hyperbolic, except that's not what history has shown us for centuries is additions. In fact, wood today, burning wood, arguably the oldest source of energy for man other than muscle power, animals and humans being enslaved to move things, burning wood today in absolute quantity terms for energy is at the same level as it was 200 years ago. We're still burning wood. In fact, burning wood today provides more energy to the world by a factor of two than all the world's windmills and solar panels combined. So where's the transition? Or maybe the more accurate measure at the global level, what you'd want to know if a transition's occurring, because you could distill this to the energy use per capita, per human being on the planet. So this is oil, coal, and gas use per capita on the planet for the last 40 years, where we've spent, again, trillions of dollars to transition away from oil, gas, and coal. The only transition that occurred was when we destroyed the world's economy with insane lockdowns, and was brief. And as you all know, oil use has rebounded to the long-run trend. There aren't any, this is just data. Now you say, well, we can try, okay. We're gonna try with exponential growth in the change of energy tech, clean tech. There is no such thing as exponential energy tech revolution. It, energy technologies, and the physics of energy do not scale the way exponential growth happens in compute and communications. My early work was in compute and communications, as Maynard said. I was, I was working in a semiconductor fab for my first job. Semiconductors and information scale profoundly differently in different physics than energy producing machines because the former can be tricked with math white space, compression, all kinds of fun things. AI is a math trick, basically. The latter is constrained by inertia, gravity, friction, thermodynamics, it doesn't, doesn't change. There's no tricks you can play against nature to get exponential growth in energy machines. This graph I'm showing you here is an example of the distance between exponential growth and Moore's law, the transistor doubling every, every uh, 18 months that the the information revolution, exponential change. A Moore's law rate for something looks like that red line. This is a graph of the actual energy density performance of lithium ion batteries that are manufactured and used since they were first put in commercial use in 1990. The Tesla came around when it went, peaked and started flattening out. Elon Musk was not foolish recognizing that big improvement had come. You can look at the math, it tripled it tripled the energy density, the efficacy, setting aside price, it's the efficacy of storing energy per pound. And then it's leveled out, went up a bit, and started going back down. The going back down, by the way, is because of switching chemistries to safer chemistries that use uh, less cobalt and use more lithium iron, iron phosphates. But the point is, it's not a Moore's Law rate. Only in comic books does energy do Moore's Law rate. If Moore's Law rate were possible in energy, what that would mean is that in a short decade or two, at a Moore's Law rate. Batteries the size of a cigar box or a paperback book, depending on your proclivities, would power a Boeing 777 to Asia. That's what a Moore's Law rate will do. That will never happen in the universe we live in. There is no exponential change in energy technology. It's silly, sloppy rhetoric. Third truth is there is no such thing as renewable energy. There's all energy sources are free. They all exist before we, were, we, we came on the scene in the history of the universe. The sun is free, so is oil, gas, and coal. All this stuff exists. We didn't, we didn't create it, we didn't pay for any of it. Energy supplies are functionally infinite in the physics of the universe we live in, including on Earth. There is no shortage of energy. What human beings have to do is build machines to tap nature's energy sources. Machines all wear out. All machines wear out, which means they're not renewable, or put differently, they're all, all renewable because all machines have to be rebuilt because they all wear out. So there's no such thing as a machine you can build that was just renewably provides energy. It's not true, they all wear out. And they all require mining of materials and metals to make the machines. And you can't recover 100% of the metals and materials you do because of a physics problem called entropy and thermodynamics. You can never get perfect recycling. The level of recycling that's affordable or even possible is remarkably limited with most materials and most metals. 
It's cheaper and easier to get virgin neodymium than it is to mine it from waste wind turbine blades because a rock is more homogeneous than the wind turbine. So it's the physical problem is more challenging in recycling than virgin mining. Therefore, it's a cost issue. What you have seen, this is just a summation of the International Energy Agency's data, that the critical fact here is not that all things require replacement. There's no such thing as renewable energy and all things require mining. The question that you should then ask yourself is how much mining does it require to produce the machine to produce a unit of energy, a unit of heat, a unit of driving, a mile, an hour of zoom time? We know the answer to those things. Roughly speaking, for an EV, there's about a 500% to 600% increase in the mining and use of metals and minerals to produce a single EV compared to a, a single internal combustion engine vehicle. For wind and solar, offshore and onshore, the increases are much greater. They're more like 1,000 to 2,000% more metals and minerals needed per unit of energy delivered to society to build the machines that wear out and that you have to mine again and rebuild. You can recycle some of it. A lot of studies have been done on recycling for those who are recycling fans. <clears throat> the, the share of reduction in net new mining possible with recycling varies depending on the mineral. But it ranges from 2% benefit to with aluminum, which is the, the easiest one for a whole set of reasons, to 60% benefit. But when you're growing something quickly, you don't have anything to recycle. If batteries last a decade, there are none to recycle for a decade. Self-evidently. So recycling batteries is irrelevant. If you want to build lots more batteries, you're going to have to dig up more copper and more nickel and more aluminum and more neodymium and more cobalt and more manganese, depending on your chemistry. So today, the world mines 7,000 great pyramids worth of rock a year to supply the minerals the world needs. Not, I'm talking about steel here, all the critical minerals. Non-steel, not. this is all the... Again, the suite of things that we use to make everything. We mine 7,000 great pyramids worth of rock to get to those minerals every year. To convert, to transition the world from hydrocarbons to, quote, green machines, the mining has to go to 70,000 great pyramids worth of rock a year. I'll make a forecast. It won't happen. See, it's an easy forecast to make. Not in our lifetime, not in our kids' lifetime, not in my grandkids' lifetime. The fourth truth is there's no green energy, precisely because of what I just told you. There's no such thing as green or sustainable renewable energy. It's a meaningless term because all energy choices involve machines and mining, using land, getting permissions to use land. Therefore, all en energy choices require decisions and compromises that can be different. There are different choices, but all of them entail land use, all of them. All of them entail minerals use. So the, all of them, then you have to ask yourself, how much land and how much, how much minerals do I need? It is well known that wind and solar route uses much more land. It's not a mystery. It's because the energy source itself is diffuse. If it weren't diffuse, we wouldn't live. If the solar intensity matched the planet Mercury, would there be a very viable case to make for solar electricity replacing a lot of things? It would also melt metal at the surface. I mean, metal melts on the surface of mercury that faces the sun. So it's not exactly habitable, and we have very weak solar energy, which made life possible. The same is true for winds. It's very windy on Venus. There's no life to our knowledge on Venus. It's windy on Saturn. I mean, the winds are thousands of miles per hour. The winds we have are gentle because that way we get to live, which means it's low density, lots of materials. Now, since we have to use materials for everything, that means there's nothing that's, quote, green or sustainable. You are making choices and decisions about how much stuff you're going to use and where you mine it and where you refine it. But I just want to remind you, uh, connect these two dots. This is, this is a, a map of the billions of tons of all classes of materials. Everything humans use, it's a material to live and survive and build civilization. We buy a mass, which includes food, and some is for fuel. All the construction and industrial materials, rock and, and iron, ore, and then oil, gas, and coal in tons, and then all the metals combined. Now imagine I have an energy system. Remember the graph I just showed you? I have to do a 1,000% increase in the tons of stuff per unit of energy. So imagine the oil and gas tons are replaced by the metals tons. This graph would look very different. In fact, it, it would look impossible because the magnitude of increase in tonnage of stuff humans have to dig from the earth, move, process, and grind up would be astronomical and unsustainable 
in the real sense of the word. The fifth truth is that reliability is sacrosanct. The reliability of energy systems is sacrosanct for a very simple reason. <laughs> Nothing exists without energy. The degree with which you need reliability depends on the thing, self-evidently. Some things you have a reliability requirements that are measured in seconds, which is data centers. Some have reliability that's measured in minutes, heating and cooling systems. Some are measured in weeks and days of storage of fuel on site for when there's an exogenous event. And there's geopolitical reliability, the reliability of getting the materials I need to build my machines. So all these things are always been critical to civilization. There's another word for it, supply chains. The supply chains have to be robust, they have to be resilient, and they have to, they have to survive three things. Accidents, because things break. Nature, because nature is always trying to kill humans and break our things, always, throughout history. And it has to survive the malicious intent of other humans. Wars and terrorism, all. The so that's how we build energy systems. The typical uh, quantity of storage of oil, gas, and coal globally in the industrial world is one to three months worth of annual energy demand. We store, counting all the batteries that exist in the United States today, we store mere minutes worth of electricity, of annual demand worth. We, we're moving close to 30 minutes worth of annual demand versus 30 days worth. The reason that reliability matters is, is obvious, I don't have to state it, but one of the manifestations of that is setting aside the geopolitical concentration. So the refined energy minerals that build the green machines, you all know because it's been widely publicized in the last couple of years, China is the dominant player. It's not going to be easy to change that quickly because it takes a long time to build copper refineries and nickel refineries and cobalt refineries. They've been building them for 20 years. We could do it. We're not doing it, by the way, at any kind of pace that's relevant. We could do it, but a geopolitical, therefore, reliability fact is this. China's market share globally in energy minerals is double OPEC's market share in oil. That has geopolitical meaning, it has economic meaning. So far, China has not exercised any pricing power. You'd be naive to think it would never happen. Day-to-day -day reliability matters on the grid. This is the, the DOE uh, map of the total number of outages annually on US grids. There's no single grid, as you know, but many grids. And it's been trending up. This, this is the wrong direction. We're becoming more dependent on things that have to be lit all the time, both at home and in our communication systems and in our hospitals, and reliability is getting worse. The reliability is getting worse because utilities have been spending time focusing on installing renewables instead of creating higher reliability systems. It's been a political decision by states and by federal government that's been put in place for two decades. And the sixth and final supply side truth, and I tried to distill all the, there's, you know, there's lots of rabbit holes in energy. You can go down, there's a problem with energy or energy debate. Every, there's always a rabbit hole you can go down. You go, what about? So I, I gave a lot of thought to six truths that are sort of encompass all the rabbit holes. And so the sixth truth is it's always about the money. So it's always about the money. So whether it's who's getting the money in the Inflation Reduction Act, try to find out, by the way. Who's getting the $30 billion of grants to ensure equity and justice, DEI stuff, in, out of DOE for energy? Not to build things, not to build solar panels, not to build copper mines, but you know, soft things. Uh, I'm talking to a reporter who's trying to find out. He's filed Freedom of Information Act requests. Congress, to my knowledge, isn't even investigating this. So who's getting the money? I'd, I'd just like to know. But it, more relevantly, that's a political observation. On the engineering side, it is always about the money. How much does it cost to build the thing, and how much does it cost to deliver the energy to people when they need it and where they need it? it and all markets want that to be cheap and cheaper all markets, all the time. And when you increase the cost of energy, and if you increase the cost of reliable energy, eventually people react. Markets react. A significant reason that Germany is deindustrializing is high cost, low reliability energy. And this is not me saying it. The EU just finished the study, if you didn't see it, released last week, and looking at why the European Union is suffering broad economic malaise and deindustrialization. The energy word was used, I think, 180 times in that report. Because energy is too expensive and unreliable, and the businesses that, are, that, that look at their future there do not see a future with it becoming cheaper and more reliable, but even more expensive and even less reliable. So they're deindustrializing. So I'll give, 
So what, the money matters to consumers, the money matters to the businesses, obviously the money matters. The money matters at the macro level in this sense. For all of human history until the advent of the hydrocarbon age, somewhere between 60 and 80% of the entire economy's budget for the entire world for all of history was consumed by acquiring food and fuel. Food is human fuel, the fuel needed to get the humans the food to survive. So 60 to 80% of all economies Deployment of capital and resources was directed to survival, to getting energy, get food and fuel. That collapsed with the advent of the hydrocarbon age to roughly 15 to 20 percent, which is a good thing because not only is our economy bigger, because it's freed up money to do other things. It frees up money to do environmental protection and healthcare and entertainment and all manner of things that wealth brings. Money matters, pushing markets in the wrong direction is consequential. This is an interesting graph that most people have not seen. It's a study done um, by folks at Cambridge, I believe, and I think it was the Stockholm Institute. But in any case, what they looked at globally for the last 20 years, the, the relative change, the overall change in the capacity factor of electric power systems in the planet. Now, capacity factors, you know what that means. What percentage of the year the power plant produces electricity? So if, in, if you're a windmill and it's in a great West Texas area, it's about 38%. And if you're in a lousy area, it's 25%. If it's solar in the, in the, in the uh, Southwest, you can get 30% capacity. And if you're in Maine and Germany where they built solar panels, bizarrely, it's 6%. That's their capacity, 6%. But what that means, that translates into something capital efficiency. For every dollar of capital you put on a machine, if its capacity factor declines, then you're getting less value for that same dollar. So we're putting capital into machines, money matters, and the average capacity factor of all the global electricity production systems is being dragged down. Now the renewables capacity factor, you notice it didn't change a whole lot early on because renewables are mostly hydropower. But as you began adding wind and solar to the, to the world's grids, then the average capacity factor for all the renewables are being dragged down. It dragged down the overall grid's capacity factors for the world. Put differently, this means that the cost of energy is rising because of the imposition of episodic energy, which has low utilization of capital. So let me switch to the demand side. So those are six truths about supply which are just facts based on what's going on. Let me give you six truths about demand, because it's all about demand. I mean, you don't make, if nobody wants the product, you, you don't make it. I mean, people who, you know, the, that old adage, you, 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 you invent it and the market will come, entrepreneurs, you have to make things people want. Demand, demand creates supply. If you don't have the supply, you don't get the demand, but the order of events is demand creates the supply, and then you supply it, you get the thing that you demanded. If you don't supply the energy, you don't get the thing because there's no energy to make it or run it. So this is the key truth. Human beings are vastly better at inventing demands for energy than ways to supply it. There are only a tiny handful of ways to produce energy, to make machines that are useful. And it's not myriad ways, it's a silly statement. There are just three. There's combustion machines, you burn something. Wood, coal, biofuel, doesn't matter. Machines that burn stuff, machines, I call them inertial engines, machines that cap capture the inertial energy in water or air, wind turbines, tidal, and what I'll call atomic machines. The machines that tap into the fundamental feature of an atom, which is photovoltaics kicking off an electron, and nuclear fission, which kicks off neutrons, essentially. Those are the three classes of energy machines that you can build, that's it. And the world's built lots of combustion machines because they're cheaper, <laughs> by a lot on average for most applications. But we invent demands. We, don't, we ha can't invent that many new ways. We can't invent new physics. We can invent new machines to use the existing physics and get a little bit better. But on the demand side, you start to think about how you would express this. So before the invention of the aircraft, there was no demand for aviation fuel, duh. Before the invention of a car, there was no demand for fuel for a car. Before the invention of pharmaceuticals, there was no demand for energy to make pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical energy demand per square foot of facility is three times higher than most manufacturing. Pharmaceuticals are a very energy intensive industry, and there's no limit to the demand for new pharmaceuticals that we would like to invent to cure diseases that nature is intent on inflicting on us. There was no demand for electricity to run computers until the invention of a computer. Obviously. So what you'd want to know is, I put it in dollar terms, instead of kilowatt hour or BTU terms, because the money matters. So if, 
if you invest, a, if, if you buy a billion dollars of cars, how much energy demand do you create? This is the answer, about $200 million over a decade. And that's true whether it's an EV or gas, doesn't matter. Silly, to, the, EVs are not fundamentally more efficient than internal combustion engines. It's, a, it's another silly trope. I could have added it to my list of truths, but it's a subsidiary list of truth. If you build a billion dollars of aircraft, you won't be surprised it creates more energy demand over a decade. Yeah, a billion dollars of chip fabs, which I put here because of the CHIPS Act, which was passed without thinking about how much energy all these factories will need in an era where we have been planning for no load growth, 300 million. And if you build a billion dollars with the data centers, the pre-AI era, it's about $600 million of electricity over a decade. In the post-AI era, it's going to be pushing up to more like, uh, see the numbers, it's, a, it's $2 billion of a decade. Or put differently, you use twice as much electricity in dollar terms is it cost to build the thing over the 10 year life of the thing. This has always been true. It's always going to be true. The only thing you'd want to know is sort of a subsidiary truth. Are we finished inventing new things? Which I'll come to in a second. Truth number two on demand, number eight on my 12 truths, is things that people care about other than survival, convenience, comfort, entertainment, healthcare, but especially convenience and comfort always drive energy demands. Give you two obvious examples. You can map this off all kinds of features of civilization. The SUVification of the world's fleet. So the IEA tracks the percentage of all new cars bought by all humans on the planet that can afford cars, and what share of them are SUVs. This is their data. It, in 2023, it reached 49% for the, wor for, the, um, for the world. So the world curve actually tilted up in the last three, four years. So why are people buying SUVs? Because they're more comfortable, more convenient. They have con more convenience is it's a utilization factor. I, can, I own three Suburbans serially over the life of our kids when they were going through things like soccer games and baseball games. And we had two had a band, wonderful vehicle, uh, very annoying to park in Washington, D.C. area, but a high utility function. That's why people buy SUVs, because of the utility function. They will buy SUV class EVs, and they'll buy SUV class autonomous vehicles, because of the, if you want a, a true autonomous vehicle to be useful, you have it big enough so you could sleep in it while it drove you to Houston, <laughs> instead of taking the bus. It would be, that'd be nice, especially if you trusted it. And why wouldn't you do that instead of take a bus or drive yourself? You don't have to have a bunch of goobers around you in the bus. You could just sit in your own car and sleep in a nice bed. That'll be a big car. I'm not implying Texans are goobers. I'm just talking about buses in general. <laughs> Tourism is a classic example of cheap energy. In fact, you, I mean, maybe you know this, this data point. Uh, roughly 85% of all air travel, air travelers do not travel for business, but differently. Only 15% of people who are on airplanes are traveling for business, globally, annually. Put differently, it means 85% of all the fuel used for airplanes for air travel is for convenience and fun and comfort and visiting family and entertainment and tourism. The, the, the trajectory of international tourist trips from just tens of millions to now billions a year is entirely a consequence of cheap energy, allowing people to both have the money to do this and having transportation that's inexpensive enough. This trend, I didn't show you the plot that shows 2020, you won't be shocked to learn that it went to near zero uh, in 2020. And you also won't be shocked to learn that in 2024, it's back on old trends. It's a deep V curve. Truth number nine, energy demands are often hidden. And they're hidden in strange ways. Uh, both Dan and, uh, and uh, Michael talked about energy being complicated. I think, I think Bob did the same thing. and, and uh, it's, it's, it is complicated, but you can, you can do the research. It's not, it's not that complicated. Google Scholar has all these data, all these reports that I use. I, f I find through spelunking on the internet to find a primary source of data. This is a primary source of research from Cambridge University again, looking at the life cycle energy costs in CO2 terms, of course, because that's what they're obsessed with. But CO2 is purely a surrogate measure of, car of hydrocarbon consumption, obviously. I mean, that's what you get CO2 because you intentionally produce it. It's not a pollutant, it's an intentional product. I just make a distinction here, it's not political. You want an exothermic reaction, that's called combining carbon with oxygen. That's the goal. The, the goal is to create CO2 molecule because it's exothermic, they're called heat. You get heat, you can use it. It's a very dense molecule, 
And in fact, the density of a hydrocarbon molecule is 50 times higher than the energy density of lithiated chemical molecules, which is why you'll never see battery powered, lithium battery powered big airplanes, because it has a 50 fold starting advantage in chemical energy density. But what they did is they looked at the life cycle CO2 emissions, energy use, for drink containers, because I don't know about you, I gotta go see if, I don't think the Omni has stopped giving me plastic water bottles. In fact, I know they haven't. When I checked in the Omni last in New York, I got my plastic water bottle, thank God, because if they ever stop, Bob, you're gonna get a note from me, because this is why. The, the, the pet plastic bottle on life cycle, by the way, life cycle is 100,000 ounces worth of consumption, which is a lot of ounces, right? So that you gotta reuse your aluminum or glass bottle, 100,000 ounces worth, to compete with a disposable plastic bottle. You, this is sort of self-evident. You, you use one third as much energy throwing away a plastic bottle as you do using glass or aluminum and, re, and using it for 100,000 ounces worth. You do the math, you're talking about 10 ounces of drink, so you're, you're doing 10,000 times of using. Nobody uses it 10,000 times. I mean, that's basically using it infinitely for your life. You still use more energy if you keep that, obsessively use it at a water fountain in an airport. You're using more energy. Grocery bags would drive me crazy, banning plastic grocery bags all over the states. So this is a plastic grocery bag. This is total energy in a life cycle basis, therefore hydrocarbons used for 1,040 grocery items compared to the paper bag. The paper bag is more energy intensive by a factor of more than five. Energy demands are often hidden. Where else are they hidden? Photovoltaic cells. Where, uh, where is 98% of photovoltaic silicon manufactured? This is not a quiz. You know the answer. It's China. I wish I could say China the way President Trump says China. So it's very, it's China. They're, they decided to, to make, to do it. It's not complicated. They're not better at it. They, the reason silicon photovoltaic cells are made there is they're made on their coal-fired grids. Not that their grid's two-thirds coal-fired. They make it where the grid is 100% coal-fired because it makes cheap electricity, because making silicon is three times more energy intensive per pound of manufacture than steel. So you need cheap energy, so that's what they did. Very smart. What that means is, just to give you an idea of the hidden energy content in practical terms, every time you see a house, an average size house in Texas or California with photovoltaic cells on it, first the silicon was made in China. It may have been assembled here, but the really intense and expensive stuff made in China. And it took 30 tons of Chinese coal to make the PV cells for that one residential roof for a 1,040 square foot house. EVs have hidden energy use. Not when you plug them in, as Dan correctly pointed out, uh, electric vehicle, the most efficient one, is cleaner tailpipe than the average uh, com internal combustion engine. It's not cleaner than the most efficient internal combustion engine, just the average on the road, but that's okay, it's a detail. But EVs require minerals, I showed you the data, four to 600 percent on average more minerals to be mined to make the EV in the first place. How do you think they mine copper and nickel and aluminum? And where do you think they refine it? They refine it in coal-fired grids in China. Copper, is, I think 50 percent of copper is refined there. 80 percent of aluminum is refined in China, uh, coal-fired grids. And they use diesel-powered giant backhoes, diesel-powered crushers, natural gas to make the EV minerals and materials. If you follow the supply chain, honestly, what you'll find is that it's entirely feasible that most EVs are emitting more CO2 just being built than the CO2 emissions they displace by being operated. So we're getting a net increase in CO2 emissions to the planet because of the hidden feature, hidden in plain sight, of where we get the minerals and how they're, how they're produced. Well, the other, uh, other hidden one, just by the way, is when you do one-click shopping, probably you do that. Like everybody does it. I remember the first time I asked somebody if they do one click shopping in a, an audience, this is sort of 2003, like two people look puzzled, but he, he put their hands up, yeah, I think I do that at Amazon. Everybody one clicks. When you go click, you are lighting up computer servers, you're lighting up cell towers, you personally. You're not only lighting them up, you're lighting up AI engines that are trying to figure out why you did it, where you did it, and when you're gonna do it, might you do it again, what ad to route to you. Using AI engines, that is crazy power hungry, and expanding at a, a prolific pace. The good part of it is I don't get advertisements for things I don't care about. So I kind of, personally kind of like it because I volunteered to let them invade my privacy by using one click. You also light up trucks and you light up the construction of warehouses. And if you do the, the net energy costs of delivering a tube of toothpaste to your door within the same six hour period, which Amazon can do, and 
fossil fuel, hydrocarbon consumption, CO2, whatever metric you want, that's a lot higher than you driving to the grocery store where everything's palletized and sit and you have to pick it up and you bring back a grocery bag with 30 things because you didn't go there for the tube of toothpaste. One click is energy intensive and is driving uh, net freight traffic. Number 10, this is an easy one, efficiency creates demand. On the demand side, you always want to make, engineers always make systems more efficient. That's what they do. The reason you make things more efficient is because people will use more of them and they become cheaper to operate. That's what efficiency does, by definition. So efficiency creates demand except in isolated closed systems. If I, if I replace an inefficient light bulb with an efficient light bulb, yes, that reduces energy at that location. Does that reduce lighting demand, electricity for lighting demand globally? No. It, what the LEDs got cheap enough, which they are, it proliferates the use of lighting globally because the world is underserved with lumens. And if you drew a graph of lumens produced compared to the energy efficiency of, of illumination, it looks just like these two graphs. It's an X-curve. As the efficiency gets better, lumens go up. The one on the left is computing trends. Computers are a lot more efficient now than they ever were by a lot, getting more efficient fast. And demand for the products they produce, bytes, is exponential. This is a log curve, by the way, on the left. So demand for bytes is up almost a millionfold, whereas efficiency of computing decreased 10,000, improved 10,000-fold. 10, Same as in aviation. Aviation efficiency drives more demand for aviation because it makes it cheaper to take the vacation. 30% of the cost of flying is still fuel. If, if a computer, if your, if your iPhone, or if you have a Pixel device, if that phone operated at the energy efficiency, electric efficiency, compute efficiency of a IBM mainframe, your one phone would take as much electricity as a skyscraper. So the reason that there are billions of phones is because using trillions of kilowatts of electricity is because they're more efficient. Number 11 is that innovation always creates more energy demands. Innovation creates demands in two ways. The one which you've heard a lot about already, about AI in the cloud. But more fundamentally, in innovation is a way to create wealth, and, and wealth creates demands. So if you, have, if you have an economy that's wealthier, people do more simplistically flying. They buy SUVs. They buy bigger houses. They take more vacations. They buy more pharmaceuticals. So wealth creation with technology is the most remarkable thing in human history. Up until the technological revolution, that sort of began in the Middle Ages and took off in the, in the steam age, the only way you got more wealth was stealing other people's wealth. Productivity was, growths were very limited. But with, by, you know, wars, you stored, stole their gold, stole their land, stole their people, stole their grain, and you got more wealth. You got more wealth by usurping it. In the productivity-driven world, which is innovation, you get more wealth by virtue of what technology does, which is create efficiencies. You also get direct demand from data centers. It's, this is the Goldman Sachs graph, which is pretty good. I just cut and pasted it. And I write about a lot in my book, so I'm promoting my book again, of course. You write a book, you have to promote a book. What you'll see in this is that it's not AI that's creating the electricity demand. It's the data centers pre-AI. I was at an EEI conference with the utility execs it was uh, four or five years ago, and I put up a graph of the two curves of U.S. miles driven, which is gasoline consumption, and it went flat during the Great Recession. And then it took off when the recession ended, as you, as you recall, around 2012, 13. So fuel use flat and then started going up again, or miles, rather. And then I put the electricity demand graph, and it's the same shape, and it's flat. And I declared then that it was an interregnum. And the reason I knew it was an interregnum, a temporary flat growth, because we've already squeezed all the efficiencies out of the systems for 20 years that we want to use less electricity for, lighting, HVAC, and we're hitting physics limits. Now what was happening, we were hiding all the net increase in demand from all the other new things, not factories, in this case, data centers, which was obvious. I was on the board of an architect engineering firm to design power systems for data centers. I was on the front lines of that for over a decade. These are massive electricity beasts. So 90% of the net new demand that everybody's shocked at coming into 12 regions of the country has nothing to do with AI. AI is getting a bad rap. 90% of the demand is coming from just old-fashioned data centers to let you store your CAD videos more, more relevantly, to do all the advisory things that you like, which ranges from mapping to Uber. These are all done in data centers. All that intermediation is done in data centers. AI is going to become a bigger piece of it and I think Goldman Sachs is underestimating how big a piece it'll become, but it's going to add to. 
It's not replacing conventional compute, it's adding to it. So it's, it's, it's gotten a bad rap in this sense. It's not creating the problem. You're creating the problem by finding data services so useful in your life and in businesses. In fact, when we talk about innovation, I have to, a couple other quick things about innovation. The most important thing about guessing innovation's future is that there are a lot of unknown unknowns. Remember the Rumsfeld? That we just don't know what people are going to invent and like. There's a lot of known unknowns, things we know we've already invented that we're not using as much as we will yet use. And those all have energy implications, which is true in a whole set of domains, but I'll just pick two because I'm back to Texas here. Um, global space economy is about 100 billion a year right now. The US is, is the leader in this. Everyone talks about correctly that as the cost of launch goes down, the economics and benefits of using near Earth orbit rise. That's happening. It's not, it's not a hard thing to predict. It's a pretty energy intensive business. Let me just, I didn't put a number here how many, how many dollars of fuel you use per decade, per billion dollars. I'll, I'm going to, no, I think I'm going to do the math on that. It'd be interesting. This is the Falcon Heavy. And the other uh, interesting energy metric is if we start manufacturing new classes of things. Manufacturing pharmaceuticals meant you need energy to manufacture them. Very intensive. It takes energy to manufacture cars, although they use most of their energy in their operation. It takes more energy to manufacture EVs and regular cars, and they use roughly the same amount of energy in their operation. So they're a net energy consumer by a lot. Mobile robots is my favorite go-to thing that we don't have a lot of today, but we will have a lot of in the future. Not because this is a, a picture of a digit uh, mobile robot that's in commercial use, started this year in an Amazon factory to do a task nobody wants to do, so they can upskill the people that are there doing skill tasks, which is take the empty bins and put them somewhere where they belong. The sorting of the full bins is done by humans still, it will be for a while. It's only a $15 billion industry. By mobile robots, I mean robots that can walk around with humans and not hurt them. Not Terminator or C-3PO, but goofy stuff like this. And to tell you that I'm not being, I want to end with just a, a, an example of how hard it is to predict the future on something that is really radical, but it's already happening. There's at least a dozen companies, more like 20, that are manufacturing pre-commercial humanoid robots for use of work with humans in high risk applications or really boring applications in both industry and commerce from restaurants to firefighting. And they're no longer, dig, Digit is already commercial. Boston Dynamics, you probably, if you, don't, if you don't geek out on robot videos like I do, you should do Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics just r released this video uh, two months ago of their latest evolution of a humanoid robot, which began with the DARPA contest a decade ago, which is intended to be able to operate where humans operate. Why would you make a ro humanoid robot? Because humans operate in human environments. R automated machines that have to be isolated in cages away from us are not that useful. There's so many tasks that we'd like to have assistance with, the machines have to operate where we are, not where they are, which means the machine has to be able to be compliant with not hurting us, bumping into us, but also physically able to operate in the physical environment that's comfortable to us, hence humanoid robots, hence the use cases for them in hospitals. But they announced this, put this video up of their uh, latest machine, and this is, this is like a 20 second video, which is the, I have to show you because it's both amazing and spooky. It's not CGI, this is, their latest iteration of a battery-powered, lithium-ion battery-powered, totally autonomous humanoid robot designed to find applications in, again, typically early on in the boring or the high-risk domains. The Navy started this program because they, they wanted um, robots, not humans, putting fires out on ships. And you have to navigate a human environment, open doors, step over thresholds, turn valves. So let me end with this. Uh, I'll make uh, my, my, my 12th demand truth. D if demand is greater than supply, it impoverishes civilization. If we invent things that are useful, we like and want to use, but we can't energize them, we can't afford to build them or power them, it impoverishes us. So the innovators who in invent the future are inventing ways of creating energy demand by definition. If we don't supply the energy at a price the market can afford, we slow growth or we impoverish people. That's just locked into just a fact. It's not an opinion. So we, the necessity of thinking and planning about adequate over-provisioning the world with low-cost, high-reliability energy is the imperative. We can't guess exactly how much energy the world would need in the future. You can never guess that right, but you can over-provision. So I'll just end with these six forecasts. What, given what we're doing right now, I can tell you there'll be more inflation because we're spending, we're gonna spend $2 trillion in the Inflation Reduction Act if it's not killed 
to replace machines that are cheap with machines that are expensive. That's essentially what they're doing, which is anti-productive and inflationary. The inflation hasn't started because they haven't really spent it all yet. We're going to see lots more oil and gas because we always have. That first graph I showed you hasn't changed. We're going to see lots more solar and EVs, not least because we're subsidizing it still widely, but because they're a lot better than they ever used to be. And even without subsidies, there'll be lot, lots more. There's lots of use cases. They're just not going to replace. They're going to add. We're going to need a lot more mining, and the world's going to do a lot more mining. Whether we do it or not is a political decision, but it's expanding at a, a ferocious pace in, uh, in Africa with Chinese funding. You're going to see lots more robots in AI. This is our local hero, Elon Musk, again, when he announced his Optimus robot, humanoid robot. He has said in earnings calls that ultimately he thinks that business will be bigger than his car business. And I agree, by the way, because... If you think about use cases for robots over the next three to five decades, there are far more use cases for humanoid robots than for wheeled robots, you know, autonomous cars. And of course, we're gonna see a lot more nuclear plants. This is a, a small, not modular, it's just a small reactor. Small modular just is a, another way to build big reactors. This is a small reactor. That's a, a few megawatt reactor, it's a trailer mount. Um, we know how to build these, by the way. We built about 30 of them in the 1950s, and the military did, and ran uh, a Greenland base, an Anchorage base, Panama. We ran, uh, there's about, there were six deployments. They ran for anywhere from a decade to two decades. Small reactors that ran the base. Uh, the reason they got decommissioned is that the designs at that time were expensive and high, high maintenance, and diesel fuel was cheaper and more reliable. These were just the early, but we know how to do this now, and we will do this now. So I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, this observation about my, my truth. So the truth is uh, the world's going to need a lot more of what Texas produces the most of on the planet next to places like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, hydrocarbons. But it's not going to be the center of the economy because what you really want is energy costs to decline so to become less and less relevant to the economy. You want profit margins to go up with the injection of innovation and AI and robots. But the absolute share of the economy, you don't want to create jobs in energy as a primary vector for jobs. You want to create high value jobs in energy. We need people in those disciplines, but it's exactly the same as agriculture. We need farmers. I, I, my family is a farming family. I grew up near farms and on a farm. Uh, farming is what? If you count gentlemen farmers and gentlemen ranchers, 5% of the workforce, that's where energy should be. It should be 5% of the workforce. We shouldn't be bragging about creating jobs there because it's anti-productive. We should be, and, and of course, it does take more jobs to put wind in to get the same amount of energy. They're right about that, which is profoundly anti-productive. So I'll make a final prediction. That won't last long because it's too expensive. Thank you. We've got time for a quick comment or two or question as we wrap up before we go to the next panel. Um, so it was a great slide to end on there, Mark, because we all now have a sense of that vision of the future. I was struck by, you know, there's this, um, there's a cultural thing which is quite good where people say, there's a problem, I'm going to do my part. Mm -hmm. There's a problem, I'm going to do my part. But one of the things I think your presentation illustrates is th these are such huge global systems, such huge global trends. Right. No individual, it doesn't make sense to internalize, you started with that New Yorker thing about your climate emotions. It doesn't make sense as an individual, you can't, you can't impact it. You can compost, right, but it's not gonna solve not this. Problem. So what do you tell people who say, this is awesome, it's so insightful, how can I help, how can I help, what could I do to affect this problem, this discussion, this future. What what can you know, students feel that way all the time? Like they want to do something meaningful, but everybody feels a certain sense of what can I do? Yeah. So what what do you think that? Uh, not, to be, is that? Not, not to be trite, but to become more knowledgeable, because they think they're doing something virtuous by using a paper bag or a paper straw instead of a plastic straw. And if you do the research, it only requires Dr. Google, not a PhD. You'd learn that. You're not, not only not doing it, you're doing something the inverse of what you thought. So becoming more domain knowledgeable and not following, we'll call them whether the social memes or, you know, popularizations are just silly. And it, it's easy to say that because most people don't think to ask the question because they just accept it. The other thing I would say is that you have to define what the problem is. I don't see a problem. 
So I mean, this is the, so I, 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 I'm not being facetious. You know, students see a problem. The problem is being defined as we use hydrocarbons and we have to stop. So they've defined the problem. So if that's the problem, then my answer to them is you can't do it. That won't happen. So it's like saying, well, the problem is we have too many people on Earth and we all want to live on Mars with Elon Musk. And I said, well, that's kind of nice, but it's impossible. We can, we can put, we will put um, half a dozen people on Mars. We can't put 100,000 people on Mars or a million. It's physically impossible. So, so just one last question, because you, you said this right up front. This is an energy discussion. This is all about energy. And you said, I'm not going to talk about climate. <laughs> Do you think in the years and decade to come, it's going to be more common that people talk about climate more, debate climate more, that the climate debate becomes less a polarized, you're either this way or that way, and more of a sophisticated discussion that might lead us to come up with some better solutions because we understand, quote, the problem better? Well, again, let me bifurcate. We will, we will understand what's going on better because our science gets better. We're doing better analyses. And Roger Pilkey is a friend and probably the best analyst and writer. I think you've had him on your show. Uh, if you haven't watched Maynard's show, you're not promoting it, you gotta, it's, it's great. He does a Close of Business Tuesday podcast, which is fabulous. So Roger is uh, he's a climate scientist, and uh, you know, he's, he's, but he's not in the apocalyptic camp. And so what I think will happen is that the climate debate, as it's currently being argued, is exhausting itself. Because pushing apocalypse is exhausting, especially since you, we're, not, we're literally not doing anything about it. The world's CO2 emissions are rising. Uh, whether or not that's accelerating or decelerating is irrelevant. In fact, Bill Gates, post Doha this year, gave an interview which he, he didn't, what he said was the correct thing. Whatever we do with all the alternative technologies, he said, will not change the trajectory of the world's, what we think the trajectory for the world's t uh, climate will be in 2050. It's locked in, whatever it's gonna be, it's gonna be. No matter what we do today, so he then pushed harder on the need to spend money on resilience and adaptation, which is politically a, a compromise because it's a hold harmless. Even if humans aren't accelerating any climate or weather or things, it's harmless. It's a good thing to increase our adapt, uh, adaptability to nature's insults. The climate extremists hate that solution and argument because they feel that it strips them of their urgency, and they're right. And so they're escalating their urgency. I think that will exhaust people exhaust themselves. The polls that I've seen, which are useful, I guess, uh, if you ask open-ended questions about what people are worried about by any age or cohort, climate change or the environment rank an open-ended question. What are you worried about? It's somewhere between number 18 and 30, depending on the demographic. Not, not the top 10. It hasn't been for a long time. If you ask people, are you worried about climate change, you'll get a, a, a majority or plurality depending on the demographic. So yeah, they're worried about it. We should do something. But if you if you say, will you pay more for energy? It's pretty much a universal no. So the, the problem is defined. We've, we've, we've let the problem be defined in a way that's not solvable. Right. So it's like the emperor has no clothes kind of thing from the kids' story tales. It is not solvable. We cannot stop using hydrocarbons. And it's, and it's even, it's not just that 82% of the world's energy comes from hydrocarbons. It's that 100% of every product and service is touched by hydrocarbons and made possible by hydrocarbons. Not some, 100%. So everything that we do is hydrocarbon infused. There's just a, what degree. And that tells you the extent of the cost impact. Obviously, if it's 80, like an airplane, it's a big cost impact. This bottle, it's less of a cost impact. So we've defined the, pro that's what, for me, I think we've done this, we've done ourselves a disservice being dragged into a debate with a de definition of a problem that's can't, that doesn't, I must say it doesn't exist. It just can't be solved. It's framed. I, th I think you just said what I was trying to ask, which is, are we going to have to redefine the problem? Yes. Yeah. And, and the problem isn't hydrocarbon usage. If the, if the problem is that nature is doing bad things to humans, whether we're accelerating that or not, let's just set the science aside. It's always a good thing to reduce nature's insults and spend money on resilience and adaptation because the weather will always try. There's always storms. There's always bad things. 
the trope that we have more extreme weather was a brilliant move on the, the political debate side. But as you know, because Roger's been on, all the data of the IPCC show that that's not true. There's not an increase in extreme of anything. You're, we're cherry picking you know, data points. But, yeah. I was just thinking, uh, you talked about energy density. Uh, you are knowledge density, <laughs> and uh, we could do this for another uh, for the rest of the day. But ca can I get a big round of applause for Mark Mills? Thanks, Peter.